Welcome back. We hope you were able to look around the expo area during the break, and I'm sure you're looking forward to this next session. Electricity has become an integral part of everyday life, with electric companies expected to keep the lights on 24-7. However, extreme events such as hurricanes, wildfires, storms, earthquakes, and other natural disasters can cause significant damage to the energy grid. During this session, speakers will share lessons learned from responding to natural disasters, as well as thoughts on how advanced technologies can make the energy grid of the future smarter, stronger, and more resilient to extreme events. This panel features Guy Chalkley of Endeavor Energy, Maria Pope of Portland General Electric, KVS Baba of Postoco, Dr. Hiroshi Okamoto of TEPCO Power Grid, and Allison Andrew of TransPower. The session will be moderated by Christine Omansur of Oliver Wyman. Without further ado, please welcome the panel to the stage for our next session, Responding to Extreme Events, Resilience, Infrastructure, and Economies. Great. Hello, everyone. Good to see everyone. And thank you very much, Vanessa, and thank you to the EEI um, for hosting the forum. So um, what we'll do is uh, we'd like to just give a, a quick context um, on uh, extreme events, um, just to open with and, and set the stage. And then we'll have uh, a great discussion uh, with the panelists we have here today. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was uh, the Global Risk Report, which is put out annually um, by the World Economic Forum uh, and Marsh McLennan. And this has over 800 respondents um, uh, to the Global Risk Perception Survey. And this is across the World Economic Forum, the members, uh, the thought leaders, different institutions. And uh, they've, they've mapped out uh, responses to what um, is considered are considered to be globally the largest risks that will impact us over the next 10 years. Um, and, and two data points to, to really point out here. Um, one is that over 50% over of respondents expect that extreme weather will become a critical threat to our infrastructure over the next two years. Uh, the second point is that the, there's a lot of different response, in, in, responses in the report. I do actually encourage everyone to, uh, it's, it's free to access on uh, WEF uh, or Marsh McLennan. It's a great report, um, pretty riveting. Um, but the other thing I'll point out is that the top six risks uh, quantified either by likelihood, likelihood or by impact, um, four of them out of the top six are all climate related. Extreme weather is the first, um, climate action failure, human environmental damage, and biodiversity loss. And if you were curious, yes, infectious disease is one of the top six as well. Um, so COVID definitely had an impact on the, on the survey this year. And I want to set this context um, because as, we're, as we will talk about today, extreme events and extreme weather will play an increasing role on the electric system over the next few years. Um, as, even as you know, across the globe, all, of the, all different energy industries lean into to energy transition um, and uh, you know, pivot uh, what we're using for generation um, and transportation. Um, and it's, you know, energy transition and climate change is steering an aircraft carrier. So as much progress as we can make over the next few years, um, we will still continue to see the accumulation um, and impacts of uh, our generation mix uh, for, for quite some time. Um, and what we wanna talk about today is how do, you, how do utilities uh, keep their compact, right? How do we stay, uh, provide accessible, reliable, affordable, sustainable power? And how do, we, uh, how do we do that in the face of extreme events? And this is especially important, um, especially as economics, especially family economics, as we've learned over the past year with COVID, are increasingly fragile. And so ensuring that we are keeping the utility compact, um, providing uh, accessible, reliable, uh, and clean power uh, while we make uh, the grid and the system and energy access more resilient, uh, it's incredibly important. So with that context, um, let's turn to the panelists. And uh, first question that I'd like everyone to respond, maybe we'll start uh, with Maria, um, is if you could please give an example of extreme weather uh, that you experienced recently, how your institution responded, and what did you learn, what were the takeaways? So thank you very much for having us here today, um, Christine, and, and all of the panelists. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. And I think we all have felt as if we've uh, lived through more than one crisis in the past 12 months. At Portland General, uh, we saw 
2 million acres burned in the state of Oregon, 10 million acres burned across the West uh, between August and September and into October last year. Um, and then most recently, we've had devastating ice storms. This was at the same time that you saw all of the issues in uh, Texas. But here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we had over 750,000 outages um, and uh, trees and limbs that we are still cleaning up uh, with uh, over 400 crews from outside the region coming in to help us. So it was really, uh, it's, it's been quite a year. We've also had, you know, a lot of social unrest uh, in the city of Portland. Um, and you've seen a lot of other issues that have taken place as a result of the pandemic uh, for, the, for the company, but also mostly important for the region. So I think first of all, we really focused on core principles. What is it that we do as a utility? And what do people care about the most going into periods of crisis? And certainly reliability is important. Uh, the partnerships we have with community members, crises take place in a very, very local uh, level. And so being able to have those foundational partnerships was important. But I think it all comes down, if you said just pick one thing, to people. It comes down to people who serve the utilities to be able to provide an essential product, probably valued more now than ever in our companies and our uh, industry's history. Um, and in a way that is uh, people are working, learning and living uh, in many ways uh, through the use of our product. So we... Um, made sure that we invest in our people and we make sure that we are also partnering with others. I'd like to uh, mention uh, TEPCO is, is one example. Uh, Okamoto-san, uh, we visited uh, your operations a number of years ago to learn about, about uh, substation hardening uh, and much, much of what we could do to improve. We have spent time in Southern California and Colorado, uh, New Mexico. Uh, we've spent time with uh, people in Australia uh, and actually have a partnership uh, working across there. So it's really about investing in people to do the right work, but doing it day in and day out. Reliability is not something that you do in a short period of time. It takes tremendous investment. I really believe creativity and leadership as we move forward. Thank you, Maria. Um, and maybe we'll, uh, you know, since you referenced uh, TEPCO, um, we'll turn to uh, Hiroshi. Can you maybe talk about an extreme event how you experienced, how you responded, what the learnings were. Uh, good, mo good morning. Uh, this is the uh, uh, right uh, nine okay in a.m. In, from Tokyo. So uh, in September uh, 2019, a very large typhoon hit our area. Uh, causing two electric poles to fall due to uh, failing, uh, falling trees and two transmission pylons to collapse due to unusually strong winds. As a result, we were with a uh, we are uh, with a powerful long period of time causing inconvenience to our customers. So the outage affected more than uh, nine hundred thousand. Uh, our customers in some areas, it took approximately two weeks to restore power. So uh, the post-accident analysis revealed uh, three main issues. And in one is the uh, inadequate preparation in advance. And second one is uh, uh, it took a very long time to get a full picture of the situation. And uh, last one was we were not able to make optimal usage of our workforce. So, uh, so then, uh, since then, the, uh, maybe the most important part of the uh, take takeaway uh, is the maybe two strengths in cooperation with external parties, uh, such as uh, other power companies, construction companies, local governments, the national government, and other people and their other partners. So, and to uh, realize them. So we increase the uh, in advance for the uh, better cooperation and uh, invest the digital technologies to uh, the more usage of the communications with other companies. So uh, that's what uh, our company's experience 
And the, in the several major typhoons that hit the country since then, although not on such a scale, uh, but there have been some improvement. Yes. So that uh, was my, uh, our company's experience. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll head south. Uh, and uh, Alison, if, if you'd like to weigh in, please. Good morning and good afternoon. It's nearly midday here in New Zealand, so I can span both time zones. But lovely to be here. Thank you. We had a very interesting um, recent um, severe weather event in December 2019. Um, we had our biggest significant um, or, biggest, or greatest asset loss in one single event. What happened, we had a very large flood that took out nine transmission towers on a major transmission line in our South Island region, feeding one of our biggest cities. And this, in the South Island of New Zealand, we have these big alpine rivers. I don't think there's very many braided river systems in the world, but they're very broad gravel-based riverbeds that can stretch enormous distances quite flat. And the river gouges paths through that can change enormously. This river normally runs at 300 cubic meters. Um, and it, during the flood, um, it peaked at over 2,300 cubic meters a second. So just an enormous amount of water came down this river, nearly eight times flow. And at 8.30 at night, we lost comms on this, um, ta all these towers. Um, so it's just about going on dark. Um, we have four big transmission lines that run across this river, including our HVDC link between the two islands of New Zealand critical supply. So um, all comms were down, communications all failed, the fibre networks were taken out, um, all the transport systems were taken out, the roading was all disappeared. The first we heard was from a landowner at one side of the river who very conveniently contacted us. Uh, he saw the tower crumple, a tower in the middle of this river that had been there on foundations for over 60 years was just completely ripped out of the river and nine towers came down. Um, because of this, one of the big key things for us learning in this is just relationships. All our service providers were instantly mobilised both sides of the river. We couldn't get helicopters up to see what had happened, but we relied on the farmers um, on the sides of the river walking up and telling us what was happening. So very cooperative landowners. Um, but our relations with our service providers, our landowners, our team, the local council who were trying to divert the river, nearly diverted it and ripped out another one of our towers, so having to work with them to make sure they didn't divert the tower, um, the line, across another line, and all of the emergency services. So um, one of the other challenges for us, we normally have a big supply of temporary towers that we would put up, but they're more designed for on land and guide and weighted towers in a big braided river system subject to further floods is not a very good repair system. So we were able to design a temporary um, tower system, get it up in place and um, take a longer time to do a big repair was a key part of it and making sure we didn't lose any supply. Um, all this happened also while COVID struck. So you can imagine we had services mobilised in the middle of a lockdown, uh, which again put quite a lot of pressure on the system. But key learning for us is about relationships, about making sure we have great relationships with our landowners on which New Zealand is long and skinny. We cross 30,000 properties, different 11,000 landowners across our country. So keeping good relationships and understanding and having that local intelligence and also having very good communication systems when you lose all ability of your telco and um, transport roading etc is quite challenging. Thanks very much. Yeah, bringing some recurring themes um, around partnership, um, relationship, um, helping mitigate and respond to uh, those disasters. Um, maybe we can move to uh, Guy, if you'd like to weigh in please. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Um, I was sort of going to start because as soon as I open my mouth, my mouth is clearly not Australian. And you sort of come from, from London in my sort of example and you sort of land in Australia and you realise they don't actually hold back when it comes to extreme weather. And so I sort of reflect on the last um, 15 months. So the last 15 months for us has been um, the largest bushfire that they sort of had in their history. We've sort of in the last month had the sort of largest floods in New South Wales. And I think they threw in the middle, you know, the actual storms um, that 
turn into sort of cyclones and they've all all give different issues to to the network um you know i think you sort of try to get to the learnings that the the bushfires were very different to the to the floods that that we had sort of a few weeks ago um and it's interesting you know we reside you know from from an endeavor perspective in a you know a very much uh, an urban with a large sort of rural um geography as well um so you can imagine that your traditional sort of overhead lines you know and you get a bushfire and you straight away think you need to underground it you get a flood and you probably think you need to overground it because they, they both give sort of different examples so the, sort of my reflection you know through them you know what sort of wins what sort of do we need to learn from it i think um you know we've got to understand that they're, they're not sort of one in 10 year events now as i say i think we've had all three we've had the trifecta in the last 15 months um and trying to react to them We've got to get better at not just reacting to them but actually predicting them to, to actually understand our network to to be ready for them i think when it actually happens you know it is really pleasing to see how the community comes together you know and that traditional of being able to to sort of harness the resource has been very good during it um i think we've learned to be much better at planning before you go in to try and recover to make that sort of network safe before you actually go there I think we've learned that we've got to get much better with our customer engagement. So I think that, you know, if I look at the use of sort of social media um, to keep a customer informed of, of where we are, because um, I think the customer has been is extremely patient early because they can see the issue. But you can lose that patience very quickly if you can't actually get power back to that customer. So you've sort of got a sweet spot where you've got to be planning to be ready to be able to get into that um you know that that area that's been affected and and get power back quickly um because i think that sweet spot with the customer you, you've got to you've got to manage that that very well um my, my sort of other reflection is i think the, the there was a real drive you know to, to get it back to what it was and and i think that sort of lends itself to traditional sort of um methods because that means if you've lost 50 poles then you sort of want to put 50 poles back because you want to get power back to a customer. Whereas I think if we could actually reflect on is that still the best solution for that customer? Um, so try to balance the speed of actually getting power back with maybe an option is something different in, a, in, an, in an innovative way. So do we actually need to restring a line to a customer when maybe a standalone power system is a better option? But but speed you know is an essence. And so I think we've got to get a better balance of that because sometimes those those disasters you know people say never sort of waste a disaster you know sometimes they they are the best opportunity for innovation because they can allow you to do it and i, I don't think we're quite we're quite stretching that as much as we can um but overall i think the the network you know i've, I've been amazed how resilient the network has been um always amazed how resilient the customer is um and i think our people who are out there doing it just do a fantastic job great thank you so much um, and we'll, we'll come over to uh, KBS. I uh, wanted to see if you could give an example of extreme weather recently, you know, how your organization responded and what were the, the main lessons learned, main takeaways. Uh, sorry, KBS, we can't hear you. Am I audible? Yes, now, you, now you're there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, First of all, let me say thanks to join, making me to join this uh, excellent panel discussion. And extreme weather conditions, I mean, India is such a large country and something or other keep happening. And we have a very diverse climate across the, from east to west and north to south. So something or other every month we have. And uh, being a system operator, we are not the actually transmission operator. We are the system operator. So we have to keep the all the stakeholders informed and what's happening. So we be prepared. And coordination of various utilities, the transmission operators, the distribution, generation, everything is uh, most important. And last few years, maybe because of the climate change, there are so many uh, Floods, so many um, and severe events have been observed. And cyclones every year is a very common phenomenon. It has become a common phenomenon. So taking care of basically being prepared how to do it, that's a big uphill task. 
and luckily india we have excellent weather monitoring and uh, warning systems have been built of late so we are able to predict in 2 3 days in advance so mobilize all the um, manpower or coordinate basically what all likely to happen so we try to streamline what is likely the affected area and keeps i mean keep all the i mean we have to be the resilience basically you can't stop the cyclones or anything we have to only be prepared after math what is how to how quickly we come back that's the biggest issue so lot of uh, coordination and lot of channeling is required that's the part like last 3 4 years we have seen at least seven cyclones and so i mean this is a very major uh, event in addition to it now, uh, himalayas are also many a times are immature mountains so a lot of earthquakes are a lot of movement things happen so that also floods also are also observed in the northern part of india that is also another area so that causes the biggest issue is the silt a lot of water comes with a lot of silt so 3000 4000 megawatt of generation suddenly goes off Thank you. Yeah, and I, I love the point. You know, an uh, ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think so. That's a, a, a great, great story. Um, and with that, I wanted to actually uh, speaking of prevention um, and uh, what we are all doing across our various entities and countries. And I, I love the global diversity of this panel. It's, it's really fantastic. Um, but I wanted to uh, turn and talk about um, new technologies, uh, data analytics. um you know prediction better prediction uh, meteorology um and you know guy and i had a really interesting conversation uh, on this topic and thought maybe guy you could share um a few thoughts on what you what endeavor is doing and and what you're seeing and how you're uh, getting up to speed in some of these areas yeah thanks christine um yeah i've sort of said um we're certainly not there yet you know i think we're on that sort of learning where you you're starting to use technology in a better way um you know and you are starting to overlay yeah meteorology but but i think you know if you sort of fast forward to sort of get in a digital twin i think our visibility of the network um is getting so much better so we're starting to build the layers um you're not there but but you're definitely improving it and i think that that's where you need to get to so if you can sort of now visualize your network knowing you know that you're going to get a bushfire knowing that the the flood could be coming you know understanding all those sort of data points on your network in terms of where sacks are and lines where trees are growing you you now overlay and how fast trees are growing so i think you're you know you're using technology rather than just people's eyes um you know you know the, the inspection sort of regime has really started to shift in the industry that it's not somebody going out to check things you know it's actually being predictive in terms of of where it is um you know and i think that is learning certainly from from a bushfire perspective um you know the, the i'm still amazed how many trees actually exist in new south wales even after a bushfire um and so and i'm still amazed how quickly they grow a six months after a bushfire so actually sort of getting all that sort of understanding of those sort of patterns you know you can be much more specific in terms of you know where you cut where you prepare how you prepare um and actually therefore just make sure that network is more resilient because the bushfire will still happen and so it's just just sort of getting that sort of understanding um and i think that there there's layers that i think we're going to continue to go from from that perspective so i think we're we're still at the start of the journey um you know and i think you know it's a pretty exciting time when you can start overlaying not just your traditional asset information but all the other overlays of information that actually can give the customer a, a much more resilient network in the future yeah thank you great uh great points I'll ask uh, Alison if you'd like to weigh in also. Yeah, very much. Um, saying, building on what Guy's saying, a lot of good situational awareness tools in New Zealand. We're lucky as Transpower. We're both the grid owner operator for the whole country and the system operator. And I think having both those functions together, although it can pose horrified views for regulators, it actually makes it an interesting and helpful way to to run a power system. So a lot of the things you talked about, Guy, we're using. We are um, situational awareness, so that. on some of our power systems are quite remote so distance to fault and understanding where faults are are there any people close by um 
what is it likely in terms of vegetation and understanding the geography so that we can auto reclose safely and not be concerned about because having to mobilize crews to get up to some um, remote areas can have power off for long periods of time so much better visibility as you say over assets is very helpful but also a lot of work on um, things like drones now we're using for much better information on condition assessment, so getting much better idea of the condition of our assets. So from an asset management perspective too, we can sweat assets better, get a better, um, that affordability, reliability piece working better. Huge amount of effort and value in, in um, getting into um, AI and machine learning. I think probably like all of you, uh, we have a shortage of data. But the challenge is getting good insights um, and I think trying to help um, in our control rooms with alarm overload and helping the um, machine, if you like, take out some of those early decisions so that actually people can really focus on adding value and insight and helping them make better, faster decisions in terms of risk. Because as you said, we're talking about uh, severe weather events, but certainly also on our power system, electrification is a key part of how we decarbonize, which again is going to put even more pressure on our system. It's going to become um, a much more critical part of our energy mix, even more critical and with severe events, resilience um, is going to be really critical. Make sure we design out where we can, but also our, our fast response to restore. So Guy, we're building on a lot of the things that you're talking about. It's exciting and in early days. Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually come back to KBS. Um, you mentioned you, uh, you know, had uh, success and um, with analytics um, and predictions, and had good monitoring systems. So maybe you can talk a little bit more um, about sophistication of the systems, the analytics, um, how you know what you're doing, maybe a little in a little more depth. Yeah, uh, and the situational awareness is the most important point in the all, all these issues. How we can cope up? So. We have about uh, 1,200, 1,400 uh, uh, phaser measurement units across the country. So all are, con I mean, we have built a lot of analytics and it is part of the control room. So that any vol voltage angle difference or any issues load that are immediately ca captured by the operator at in the control center. and. Uh, Luckily, we are also, I mean, any resilience issues that we require as an investment are, so our regulators are immediately there to say yes, to go ahead. So that way we have very, I mean, we are fortunate to uh, have such these things. And we have been, I mean, over the last few years that Indian Meteorological Department also have developed their uh, capabilities and we have a direct, uh, MOU with them and uh, co coordination. So they keep us informing and this weather related information every two hours they keep sending us what's going to happen at which place. So the so a lot of analytics on the weather side have been not by us but it is a Indian Meteorological Department Government of India. So they are excellently we are coordinating. So a lot of analytics are being developed are under still progress and not only that we have now recently with the indian space research organization also we have mapped our transmission system with that so any event in the solar or anything so we are able to map onto it mm -hmm. so it's helping us a lot on technological uh, interventions are there yeah thank you and i think you touched on something important um with was communication and enablement um, with your regulator to uh, support these activities. Um, I just I want to come back to that point, but I want to hear um, from Maria and then uh, Hiroshi uh, around what you're doing around data and analytics. Sure. You know, I think we're doing a lot of the same things uh, that has been spoken to before. And um, it's remarkable. We're all in different parts of the world, but the commonality uh, is, is, is impressive, whether it's FLIZR or fault detection or some of the things that Guy's talking about. It's just uh, we're all dealing with the same issues. And so the question is, what do you do first and how do we tackle these problems? We've had 
you know, two one in 50, one in 100 year events in the last 12 months. Uh, we've had micro burst storms that we, I don't think we've ever had in the history of the state. Uh, it took down a transmission line. Uh, uh, you know, we've lost in total three transmission lines just in uh, the last number of months. It's uh, an unprecedented period of time. But I think what's what's really interesting is if we're able to use data, then we can put the right technology and the right hardware into our system for the right result. Um, and it won't be perfect, uh, but we will be able to talk with regulators, we'll be able to talk with community leaders, and we'll be able to understand what's going on uh, from a forecasting standpoint, from an operational restoration standpoint, um, as well, and the Kai brought this up, from a customer communication standpoint, because I think that's one of the issues. We get uh, our system, we get uh, investments in our system, we understand how to respond, but we're dealing today in a completely different customer environment where they wanna know things that we're not used to communicating at scale. When you have 900,000 customers, a million customers out of power, how are you communicating down to the residential house level in a way that they are used to seeing from other service providers? And so this communication piece and the data analytics overlapping it is really important as we move forward. It will also help us in early detection of really where outages are. You know, obviously I'm sure most of us all have smart meters and, and other sensing technologies from that standpoint, but being able to interact with customers on their cell phone and give them really good predictability and restoration. And, and I think in many instances, uh, because the utilities have been successful in restoration and hardening of the system, we're frequently looked at to uh, for stability across other uh, social aspects of our society, whether that be hospitals, whether that be water treatment facilities, sewer facilities, other things like that. Um, you know, I think in many instances, our industry is beginning to step in and help provide reliability society-wide. Thank you, excellent, excellent points. Um, and Hiroshi, uh, anything to add? Uh, uh, thank you for your question. So, uh, uh, the, in, uh, uh, so very large typhoon uh, hit uh, our area, as I mentioned. Uh, so, in that case, for example, we used a uh, drone, uh, for example, but the we had uh, enough pilot drone to cover a very wide, wide area uh, in the short time. So, uh, after uh, uh, the, the typhoon, we as we have established a drone, drone operation team to uh, uh, the uh, and uh, in addition we have uh, used some the uh, kind of the uh, the damage est estimation system of facilities of our facilities due to the extreme extreme typhoons, uh, so uh, we can use, use it uh, to estimate the damages before the typhoon is uh, coming, hitting our, so uh, we can uh, dispatch our rock forces before the typhoon is coming right now. So uh, that would uh, shorten uh, the restoration period uh, for our uh, service territory. That, so uh, maybe uh, in addition, we have the uh, installed uh, several digital system to monitor our system control areas and the our facilities, work workforces. In some cases, we are using the uh, data from the smart meters to. Uh, can I say to grasp our uh, the uh, some this uh, some inf information of our low voltage network technologies? I think uh, very 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 effective improve the remains of our system. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think all great responses um, from weather predictions and definitely the the customer interface and communication. Um, and, and innovative uses of technology. Um, I wanted to turn to uh, resilience and investment um, in infrastructure resilience. 
um, since as we see more and more of these, you know, multi-year events compressed into the span of a, a couple of years, um, it just becomes much more more clear how much we need to, uh, and I think Guy said it well, like, you know, rethink, right, where we're investing and in, in how we're providing um, uh, power and energy. Um, also, we need to, you know, really think strategically about where to where to put our investments, right? No one's got unlimited uh, resources. Um, and so I think what, what, what I'd like to talk about is um, how do you think about uh, investing in resilience? How do you prioritize that? Um, and then also really importantly, how do you communicate that, explain that to the regulators, the stakeholders, um, any, any you know, challenges you've seen there? Um, and I'll, I'll ask Allison to uh, lead this one off. I know we, we talked about it and had, had a pretty interesting conversation. So. Thank you. The I think one of the things we've been thinking a lot about is what is the least cost best way uh, to solve this issue, this, you know, building a more and more bulletproof system at more and more cost, fast restoration. And one of the areas that's, um, and as I say, particularly in a long skinny country that's not connected to anyone else in a long skinny grid, one of the things we see is so important is with this new future and consumer participation, as we all get electric vehicles and solar and we have home energy management systems Systems, how do we build more resilience behind the grid into um, the home so that actually the grid can become perhaps more of a battery charging system, but people have more ability in small um, connected areas. So looking a lot at what are those platforms, what are those rules that need to be in the market, how do we encourage uh, consumer participation, how do we make sure the right investments are made, and that things like um, electric vehicles and batteries and home energy management systems are smart, and that they can participate in the market, and we can value stack them properly so consumers can actually get full value from their investments. That's not taking anything away from what we need to do in terms of building a, a grid and resilience into generation, transmission, distribution. But it's around that whole end-to-end -end system and having a look um, at that. I mean, in New Zealand, we um, are probably quite prone uh, to severe weather. We have um, a shaky island, lots of earthquakes. We're designed to a 1 in 2500 year earthquake design for our transmission systems, which is, um, if there's an earthquake that big, I'm not sure I'll be left standing. So there is quite a lot of resilience built in, but we all know you can't keep gold plating on the side if you don't think about everyone's role. And it's an exciting future for consumer participation and our role in enabling that. We've worked out in New Zealand that we can avoid one to two billion dollars of investment in excess hardware such as generation transmission distribution if we really get the demand side participation working effectively. So there's a lot of value there for everyone in that system. Thank you. Uh, great points. Um, and Maria, I'd like to hear a little bit from you uh, on, on topic you know, resilience and how oh, you know, how you've communicated that and, and done that with the regulators. So I think Allison is exactly right. She's talking about uh, really an integrated bi-directional grid that takes what we've normally thought of as at the larger utility scale. And with, through data analytics, communications been able to take that same functionality to really a residence by residence basis, creating much more resilience. But one of the other things that we're able to do is much of the activity that it goes into building a resilient grid is the exact same equipment, the exact same technology that goes into building a smart bi-directional grid. So as more sources um, or more uses of electricity come onto the system and more sources come on, we actually become more of a platform and more of a reliability deliverer. So our, our value proposition is quickly changing and that's hard to convey to regulators because we all have rules and processes and systems that we're working towards. But as we look, we're really becoming, you know, some would say it looks like an app on a phone versus minutes. Some would say it looks like an insurance product. Some would say it would say it looks like a subscription. Um, but it's we're really changing the way people are uh, consuming what we do. And I think reliability is is now going to be valued in a very different way than it was before versus where we predominantly had all the value just on, on energy and on, on kilowatts or megawatt sales. So we're, I, when we look at our customer growth, we look at investing in aging infrastructure, we look at building out a smart integrated grid, as Allison so aptly put, uh, as well as uh, clean renewable energy. We see all of those things as intersecting so that we can get the lowest cost for customers. 
And I would say on top of that is an overlay, and you've brought it up a couple of times, technology, data, digital, more technology. You know, it's, it's being able to lean forward in a cost-effective manner. Um, I am constantly surprised at how we can get lower costs out of the same or and better activities than we could just a couple of years ago. Yeah, excellent point um, in terms of uh, the march of progress um, and how we can uh, you know can continue to drive cost out and still keep you know keep value um, to the customers and, and the system. Um, so maybe Guy, you could build on that. I know we talked a little bit about um, resiliency and, and customers and uh, and your thoughts would be great. So look, look for me, um, I think people have got to appreciate. We all, we all know in an industry where I think the the pace of change in the last three to five years has been phenomenal. Probably something we've not really experienced before. Um, and so it's sort of not unusual when you know you suddenly got customer options that that were never there in the first place. That, that I think your policymakers, your legislators, your regulators are not going to be at the same pace. And you've sort of got to sympathise because even we struggle to keep pace. So so I think there is that disjoint at the moment. So we're still playing to old rules that probably fundamentally are based on we give power to a customer um, and we connect them to the grid when we know the option in the future is going to be coming the other way and they might not be connected to the grid. And, you know, we can see how distributed energy might work. So I think, you know, we've got to sympathise, but we've got to lobby well to actually make sure that the options that the customers are getting in the future are the best options, not yesterday's option so i think that, that that's a bit i think that's you know really playing out for me um but I, but i think yeah you've always got to put put the customer first you know don't put the regulator first don't put the policy first um be, because we've got to influence and change to to work to where we need to get to but yeah we we know how much it's changed um you know i've, I've been in the industry a pretty short time and and i'm pretty happy i've picked these years because you know the the amount of excitement and energy that's sort of in there at the moment, because um, because you know you can give a better solution going forward um, than possibly what was there in the past. Yeah, no, well, great points on the customer. Also, um, uh, KBS, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing in India and how you're working with the regulator um, and the stakeholders. I'm sorry. Are you asking me? Oh yes, I was. Thinking, I was thinking, hoping you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you're you are thinking about resilience and you know how maybe working with the regulator and stakeholders to to make yeah. those improvements. Um, infra infrastructure for resiliency is the most important factor. Anyway, I've we are actually system operator. We only try to, but it is that the stakeholders like distribution utilities and the transmission, they are the most, most issue. Generation is not that going to get affected due to these like, events, basically. They don't get disturbed very rarely. But on the distribution side, yes, it's the most important point is once the hurricane or the cyclone goes, how fast the rest restoration takes place. So at the towns and when we have been uh, advocating for conversion of four headlines to underground, at some places it takes place, but not at all places. There's definitely it's an, I mean, economic and I mean, this thing. Many regulators have been, uh, I mean, are giving permissions, are allowing the distribution utilities to do it. But there is, uh, I mean, that that much investment people are really apprehensive. But on the transmission side, yes, we have made it ensured that that emergency restoration systems are there, the towers that have collapsed are immediately can be respond, um, and restored. So India, we have luckily about 70% is owned by one transmission utility, so they are very well equipped. So the issue is not that difficult, but on the trans state utilities, as we know, we have, India is more of a federal uh, system. So the states are not all are at the same level of uh, uh, preparedness. There we have difficulties. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But in general, government and regulators appreciate the resiliency and uh, sanction those costs. Right. Thank you. 
Um, and I want to make sure we, you know, we hear from uh, Hiroshi as well. So anything uh, to add uh, or unique perspectives on how you're uh, working with the regulator or uh, stakeholders in, you know, in making those resiliency investments? Uh, Hiroshi. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, now we invest uh, to reinforce the world that our twin towers and invest in, in technologies and uh, but the we uh, I think that the, there's a, some piece uh, uh, the understanding of the uh, retailers and the customers of the cost burdens on them to increase uh, uh, the uh, resilience of our system. So now, uh, now we think that the most important part is the customer involvement to increase. It. Uh, resilience. For example, now we have the many, many, we, we, we are having many, many distributed energy resources, including the battery energy storage. So uh, now we think that the kind of the cooperation of our system reinforcement and uh, the better usage of distributed energy sources to strengthen the, uh, uh, the resilience in the, some uh, community. So, uh, that's why we have established the uh, resilience uh, uh, network of uh, of the um, maybe by the nine utility uh, companies and other uh, or, uh, sixty uh, companies to increase the uh, resiliency by the communication and the cooperation of the many many enterprises with the community. Uh, thank you. Hmm, thank you. Yeah, so great, all, all great points um, on, you know, measures, you know, customer um, information, building resilience into the home, uh, thinking through undergrounding um, and how to, you know, how to uh, optimize some of those investments. Um, I want to do one more, uh, one more topic, which is uh, quantifying and communicating about risk. Um, and then we'll take with a, a couple questions from the audience. So we'll see um, how many of those we can get to. Um, but what I wanted to turn to next is now that we've uh, worked through uh, some of these extreme events and the experiences and the learnings um, and, you know, how we're thinking about investing in, in resilience um, is actually quantifying uh, the, the two main types of climate change related risk, um, the actual physical uh, risk to assets, as, as we've all experienced here and in, in, in been discussing uh, during this hour. And then the actual, and we've touched on these other risk, um, but wanted to kind of bring it out a little bit more, the actual energy transition risk. So as, um, you know, we move away from fossil fuel generation, um, what's the, what are the risks thereof? And, you know, how, how quickly is that pace of change, you know, changing that risk register, um, if, uh, if you will. And so I think, I know uh, Allison had uh, some, some great thoughts here. So let me ask you to lead off and then we'll, we'll, we'll do another round. Yeah, um, I think each probably country's power system will have different challenges. In New Zealand, we're very lucky. We're 85% renewable power already from hydro geothermal. Um, we, our government is ambitious and has set a goal net carbon zero 2050. The challenge we have, and we've now got a climate change commission that's setting carbon budgets. I feel like we've been sort of pushing this electrification snowball up a hill and now suddenly it's gone down the other side and am I going to have an avalanche in terms of how to catch this? I think um, some of the big challenges around um, as a transmission company takes a long time to build um, and get assets underway. Our last big line took us 10 years to build. That's not going to work in this new electrification. We have to be responsive. We have to be fast. How do we make sure we have the right grid in the right place at the right time when no one can tell me with any certainty where demand's going to come from, where new generation is going to come from, how fast? I think in New Zealand we're on this tipping point of this exponential growth. In the past in utilities we've been able to plan for pretty geometric, pretty progressive growth, maybe one or two percent demand every year. 
that's a relatively easy thing to cover. If you start to get exponential growth, we, we're predicting our demand for electricity might increase by 70, 60, 70% 70 by 2050, but I can't tell you when it's going to come and how. That makes least regrets grid planning really quite challenging. So I think um, we've moved from trying to push the agenda forward now to how do we make sure we are not a block in this um, decarbonisation, and that's a different challenge we have to respond for. How can we get more nimble, but still make sure we plan and we do all our costings and get things? So that's going to be a challenge for us. And I think um, one of the issues we have in New Zealand with a very ambitious government with a strong climate change agenda, how do we help where possible make the decisions uh, still make sense? Our government has um, a very strong mandate for a 100% renewable power system um, that has no thermal fuel in it. We only have a hydro storage system of four to six weeks storage. Right now we're heading into a winter in New Zealand where we have not enough fuel in our system, not enough water in our hydro dam lakes and not enough thermal fuel to potentially to um, firm. So we are doing some rain dances at the moment. Um, and long term, if we move away from all thermal fuels, what are the cost effective ways of providing a 100% renewable power system? We think we can get to 95% without a problem, but actually that last part of firming in our absence, where we see right now with thermal fuel, will be challenging. So that's why I think everyone is in a different situation. We're already starting from a highly renewable system. We're not running that we don't have the issue with stranded assets running to old coal plant or even new coal plant that's going to shut down um that's not the challenge we have but it's a it's a different challenge mm, no, thank you actually yeah, excellent point and uh, you know it's it's a definitely different uh answer and in, in different thinking um depending on generation mix and you know what existing asset uh assets and plant look like um so maybe a uh, guy if you can uh, weigh in around you know, how you're thinking about risks on kind of both sides, you know, both sides of the actual physical and then the, the transition. Yeah, so pro probably picking up Alison's point, you know, and, and so a lot of our issue is not in the top end. So, you know, wh whilst there's been a big move away from fossil and, you, and you've seen the sort of connections of, of large solar and wind farms in Australia, you know, the real change we've seen is actually in the distribution space. So, you know, Australia's, I think, got the highest take up of solar rooftop you know PV in the world so I think over 20 percent of Australians have actually got rooftop solar so down in the distribution space that's where the generation is you know I think South Australia had a day in October where their generation was literally off of solar rooftop PV so I think that's the challenge that that you're really trying to address and if you pick that five years ago it would have been a pretty small number you know now it's enormous um, if you pick today um, battery storage is a pretty low number, but you can see it's going to take the same curve that solar PVs took. So, and I think, what, what does that mean for, for us as a sort of a distribution business? You know, our real challenge is just to have invisibility of that data. You know, so, so you know, I've sort of said you can, you can build a new power station on people's roofs in nine months, but I actually don't know what's being produced, but it will be pumped back into my network. So, you know, trying to trying to get and utilize what's out there in terms of the, the data to actually then maximize a, a really efficient, um, resilient network going forward is probably the sort of dream that you're trying to trying to chase. So yeah, I think Australia's definitely got a real you know downstream you know renewables challenge, but uh, yeah, you've got to get both the engineering solution and then the market solution for. Right. Yeah. The, an excellent point on the engineering versus the market. And we need both of those the technological commercial learning um, to really come together and especially to get certain technologies, you know, further down the curve. So they're both um, tech, uh, technologically and commercially viable um, and keeping that mix uh, affordable. Um, so I want to hear from a few more folks and we'll do kind of two quick lightning rounds. I want to finish up this round first. Um, maybe uh, Hiroshi, if you can uh, weigh in on how you think about uh, how you're thinking about assessing the climate change and the transition risk? Uh, that would be our main challenge for the uh, our companies. And uh, uh, I think the most important part is the to ensure the diversity of the technologies. And uh, last, uh, we, last winter, uh, Japan 
uh, faced a uh, surprise shortage uh, of the electric power uh, because of the increased in the decreased power produced by photovoltaic uh, for extreme extreme the uh, uh, weather weather condition of winter and the we now we have very very high dependency for the import of the liquefied uh, natural gas and the now increase we are seeing increasing the photovoltaic so we need some uh, in that case, it's very difficult to ensure the uh, adequacy and the uh, resilience uh, of the energy system. So we have a diversity in the uh, low carbon or uh, carbon neutral society because the, uh, that means uh, we have to have the many, many technologies like uh, photovoltaic, hydro, wind power, in the nuclear and some the uh, decarbonized uh, fossil power plants and the CCS technology. So maybe we need some, and of course we will have the better battery energy storage. So the combination of the uh, different technologies could uh, maybe improve the resiliency of the energy mm -hmm. system idea. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Um, as we get more uh, advancement in technology, right, helps helps us answer some of those risk questions. Um, so I know we've got less than five minutes left. I do want to hear um, from KBS and Maria, and we'll try to squeeze in uh, the lightning, a couple of lightning rounds. Uh, so maybe um, uh, KBS, if you'd like to go ahead just, uh, quickly on you know, how you're assessing risk, at climate change risk. Yeah. Uh, see. You see, you said renewables are, uh, I mean, I didn't get exactly. Oh, yeah, sure. How you, um, how your company uh, is thinking about assessing uh, the climate change and energy transition risk? Yeah, see, towards this climate change, of course, India is all, uh, I mean, determined to cooperate or uh, collaborate and make changes. So a lot of Interventions are taking place, introduction of, we have, our Prime Minister has given 450 gigawatts of renewables to be coming in, in the next seven, eight years. So there are a lot of interventions, policy, regulatory and all have happening. We are also, we are getting geared up how to combat it, how to, because India, we have about so far 70% is a fossil fuel. Uh, generation so, the, so far that is the best generation so we are really working how to integrate so a lot of uh, flexibility is a one issue climate change so how to do it basically so the flexibility of their existing thermal fleet are mm -hmm. reintroduce more flexible uh, resources battery is there no doubt but it's very costly so we have to see how to go about so a lot of uh, permutations, combinations are going on and we are all working on. So, but we are geared and I mean, serious about the climate change and the, I mean, while maintaining the resilience, that is a biggest issue. Yes, thank you. And by, last but not least, uh, Maria, if you might want to give some thoughts and put a bow on it. Thank you. I think we're looking at uh, risk in a whole new way across our company in every function. But most importantly, uh, between different departments in different areas. So between distribution and generation, uh, between customer and uh, technology. Uh, from a climate standpoint, we're looking at 80% reductions in carbon from our 2010 levels by 2030. And we have an aspirational target, uh, assuming that technology is available, of net of zero carbon emission from the energy we produce and, and sell to customers by 2040. That's about uh, not too dissimilar from many other utilities in the United States, maybe a little bit more uh, aggressive than some. One of the things that we just did in December, we brought online the first of its scale wind, solar, and battery storage facility in one large uh, fa uh, facility. And what we're able to do, since the wind largely blows at night, is have that very complementary with the solar. And then the battery storage also provided a bridge. And as a result, we were able to better utilize the most expensive asset we have, which is our transmission into load centers and our customers 
in a much more economic way. So what we saw, the combination of technologies actually lowered the risk quite substantially. And again, to your point around AI and advanced technologies, much of that integration takes place um, in an automated fashion uh, using AI. So it's, it's a whole new world, uh, but risk management uh, is definitely um, elevated, I think, in all of our organizations uh, in a way that we hadn't seen before. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone. Um, appreciate all the thoughtful responses and the great discussion. Um, we are I'm being told that I do not have time for my two lightning rounds, uh, which were, is there, you know, we got a great question from the audience around, it, you know, what's the role of natural gas and RNG um, in, in the future and how does this, this play into the energy mix? Um, and, you know, and what's the top risk uh, to the system, but we'll have to reconvene and discuss those um, at a later time. So thank you again, everyone, uh, and really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having thank us. You. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our panelists. It was great to hear the lessons learned from your own experiences, which cover such a wide geography from the US to India, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. We know that as we prepare for the energy systems of 2050, resilience and risk management will continue to be critical.